we this one problem and uh, i think we need to do more but what we are doing is we are trying to now <coughs> solve the question of emi in which the emf is induced using the rotating objects right <coughs> yes earlier it was translating objects now we are moving towards the rotating object so <coughs> A rotating object will uh, produce the induced emf and that emf we are going to use to uh, up, you know connect in a circuit of resistance and that resistance will create the i mean uh, will dissipate the heat energy and as the heat energy will dissipate to the resistor the rod <coughs> will start losing the rotational kinetic energy Okay. Yes. So in a way, it will slow down, <coughs> isn't it? Yes. So the way we achieve this uh, configuration is we draw a connecting loop, <coughs> and over which we have a, a rotating uh, rod hinged at the center. and the way we connect is we connect one end of the circuit to the <coughs> the center and other end we just touch like this And we have a transverse magnetic field in which the rod will be rotating, right? Yes. So this will be the configuration. And uh, what do we impart to the rod is omega naught, which will eventually decrease so that uh, at t equals to zero. <coughs> so at uh, t equals to zero, rod is given. Initial <coughs> angular velocity omega. I hope this is clear. Yes. Okay. And now, <coughs> subsequently, what will happen? So at any instant t, the the induced emf will be half b omega l square, and you can see that induced emf is function of omega. Omega is changing, uh, so it, that is called instantaneous emf induced, and therefore the current at that instant will be <coughs> we can call I induced, which is e induced by resistance of the resistor. So we get uh, <coughs> I induced, and the next part was finding the torque on the rod about the center. Right? So for torque, how what we do? <coughs> the rod is there and it is turning. So we need to take a small piece of it, and uh, the velocity of this small piece will be something like this. So we know the force will be I, which is going through the wire. And uh, <clears throat> because the this is at high potential, this is at uh, low potential. So V cross B will give you the sense of high and low. So the outer is high, and the inner is low. <coughs> so it will act as a cell like this. And so the current flow will be like this. And come to the here, come here. <clears throat> so 
So the fourth will be how much? So df equals to the i is i, and let's call dx. And since we have cut the x at dx, so this will create a torque about O. So we can call d tau O, and that will be df into f. So elementary force will create a <coughs> elementary torque, and the value of force will be this much. And because every element is at different distance from the center, so all will contribute different value of torque. So now we have I D D into X, and uh, this uh, will be equals to. So I we know the value. Anyway, so this is I D X D X and. If you integrate from zero to L, this is this the uh, the new the net torque value I D L power two, and we know that this torque will oppose or support the motion. <coughs> this torque is going to uh, be always oppose. Oh, so it will always oppose. Oh, oppose. Yes. Yeah, this so your is, voice is yeah. seems a, sir. You uh, sir, it's not like Alia. it sounds a bit thicker than usual. Sir. Okay, just just one. Let me connect computer. Just one. Okay. Uh, am I audible to you now? So, yes. Is it better than before? Yes, sir, it's better. Okay. So now the torque will be. Now I was asking that this torque is now this actually this arrow was representing the velocity reaction, so I should remove this arrow. Okay, this is misleading here. So the force <coughs> because the current flow is this way. So yes. DL cross B, DL cross B will be upward, right? Like this. Yes. So there are many things which is confusing us. So this is DF and uh, and the omega was like this. So omega is clockwise, and, and the torque you can uh, easily see it's anti-clockwise. So, so we are considering this to be a vertical plane. Uh, yeah, I mean, not vertical, you can say horizontal. Plane. Because in vertical plane, gravity will also come, right? Yes, sir, but then when you said upwards. Upward in the sense in the diagram, I mean, as per this uh, blackboard. Okay, so, so along the plane. Yeah. So okay. it is acting, you know, like right angle to the rod and uh, 
the sense of rotation if you see that the rod is trying to turn clockwise but the torque is anticlockwise so it is going to uh, decelerate or slow down okay yes so the angle because this is the only force or you can say this is the only torque acting not force this is the only torque acting <coughs> so we can say the angular acceleration will be minus by moment of inertia about this is what we did right yes sir and uh, <coughs> this turns out to be minus uh, i induced vl square by u i okay. now let's substitute the value of i not which is m l square by 3 and the i induced itself is how much b l square omega by 2 r so <clears throat> this gets cancelled so what we are getting here is minus uh, 3 by 4 m r and this is b square l square omega so if i take if we choose uh, k equals to 3 by 4 b square l square by mr <coughs> so alpha is basically minus k omega and then after this or beyond this what we need to do is called the dynamical equation so because alpha is minus k omega so we can add alpha equals to d omega by dt <coughs> and that is minus k omega so we know how to solve differential equation Yes. So, okay. So now <coughs> the answer we, we know this is very much uh, known formula because we know that uh, if the differentiation of a quantity is proportional to itself, it means the quantity must be exponential function, right? <coughs> so you are differentiating omega and the answer is also k omega, which means you are differentiating something, a function, and that is giving you <coughs> a function which is similar to the one, which means it must be exponential function. So we got the omega and you can see the omega will decay exponentially. So this is very much similar to the linear uh, translatory circuits. Okay. Now you can also I mean write the answer in terms of angle theta. So So what you're going to here is <coughs> because alpha is minus k omega so you can also write as omega d omega upon d theta is minus k omega and because this gets cancelled <coughs> so this is k d theta and uh, if you integrate then <coughs> This is omega naught. This is theta. This is so omega minus omega naught is minus k theta. So omega turns out to be okay. yes. <clears throat> and then. Uh, when it will stop eventually when omega is zero then you will get the maximum angular displacement which is so this is called maximum angular displacement okay.
so maximum angular displacement we got this answer uh, omega not by uh, k and uh, <clears throat> the other analysis that we need to perform here is like uh, energy analysis so let's do it energy So every EMI circuit, like when you create a circuit which in which we use the electromagnetic induction, we know that there is no source of energy. So we don't have the source. So if, if we have some energy, then it must be present somewhere which is getting converted. So the initial kinetic energy given to the rod is the mechanical energy, which gets converted into electrical energy in form of heat dissipation through the register. So register is actually dissipating that energy which was given to the rod. So <clears throat> you can say always that uh, the heat dissipation is always equals to, this is called the heat dissipation. Is uh, always equal to loss in kinetic energy. Of course, here we talk about the rotational kinetic energy of the rod. <laughs> so we need to use one formula from the rotational dynamics and that is delta H equals to half I. And because we are saying a loss, so initially is more and finally is less. So we can write like this. Is this clear? And if you wish to write in terms of time t, so we know that the omega is omega naught square and omega we can write as omega naught e power minus kt, so which is minus 2 kt, right? Yes. Isn't it? So <clears throat> the delta will be ml square omega naught square by 6. 1 minus 2 8. So you can write the answer. <coughs> the amount of heat dissipation as a function of time t by this simple relationship. Okay. The next part that they would ask is called the power. So for power analysis, what you can say that for rotational power, so the way of writing is tau omega. So torque about O into omega is called the rotational power, and Here we have to use actually tau dot omega. And if you remember the torque was against omega, so <coughs> the rotational power will be minus. Okay. So the power is negative, it means it, the energy is uh, taken away from the source. Okay. So the ampere torque, just like ampere force, we have ampere torque. So ampere torque will take energy away from the rod. And that energy it will give as a electrical or convert as a electrical energy. Okay. Now, what is interesting? They will ask you that uh, what is the, the relationship of power and omega? So, <coughs> the torque itself, if you remember, the torque itself was here. I B L is square root of it. I. But I itself was how much? You can remember half B omega L square by resistance. So the power here it will be minus B square L to the power 4 upon 4 R into omega square. So power is proportional to square of omega. So this is something which. <coughs> So as the omega will decrease, the power will decay much faster. Okay. 
I hope this is clear. Yes. So these are variety of questions that you will come across from the <coughs> rotational. Now in the question, instead of a rod, they might they might use a disc. So for a rotating disc, if you remember, if you have a, a rotating disc, So if this a disk is rotating with omega, you can make a similar connection here, the center of the disk. And uh, let's say the radius is capital, uh, let's say the radius is uh, A, that's better. So even for the disc, the induced even for the periphery and the center is always same. So even if I give you a disc, uh, your answer will remain same. Is this clear? Sir, can I like Theoretically explain how this is. Okay. <clears throat> if you have a disc, imagine which is uh, moving in a transverse field. And now you <clears throat> consider any small portion. Uh, so you can cut a ring first of all. So move R cut D R. And then in that D R also, you take a small portion. So for this DR portion, <coughs> what will be the induction across the length? So you can not the same way. D equals to V cross B huh? dot DR. So it is, you can say V, B, L, whatever. So it's uh, omega R, V, B, <coughs> and DR. Yes. So if you go from the inner edge to the outer edge, now if I call D of D, let's say this is the D of D E. Okay, so that's a small piece of it. And if you try to convert for the entire ring, it is going to be same answer, right? So basically, this answer yes. is for the entire ring. Yes, sir. So 
So the net value will be how much? <coughs> right yes sir. so the method is same uh, derived using the symmetric oh. okay so, uh, sir i don't understand like how the emf is induced as a, like not the theory as in like no, we have discussed this. I mean, uh, if you look at the electron, then <coughs> these electrons are also moving as per the rotation of disk, right? Okay, yes, sir. So those electrons will experience force in each direction. If you write the force, it's a Q V cross B, right? Yes, sir. Now, if you think Q is positive, then V cross B will be uh, upward, right? Yes, sir. But it's a negative charge, so it will be downward? Yes, sir. Which means all charge will come towards center, yes. negative charge, and because all the negative will come towards center, so edge will become positive charge. <coughs> okay, sir. yes, sir. So the center and the periphery will have some difference. Yes, sir. And because our connection is between center and the periphery, so that difference will also get. Yes, sir. So the answer is uh, now it is obvious why the answer. Yes, sir. Understood? Yes, sir. Okay. So, So we have two more questions to be discussed. That is from S. Verma, but that's a very really good question. So it's called vertical plane. Okay. So if we have a circuit in a vertical plane, so <clears throat> if we have a ring, a conducting ring, and the rod is starting like this from here, at any instant t. This is at t equals to zero. <coughs> Let's call the length as a l. And after time t, the rod is turning with the value omega t. <coughs> Here omega is constant. It is given to us. And this entire configuration is submerged in transverse magnetic field. And uh, <coughs> we have a similar circuit like R circuit. Okay. So now here the rod will also have mass m. Now definitely the rod cannot move on its own with constant velocity, isn't it? So rod will move with constant angular velocity only if some external agent is active. Okay. So assuming the external force is acting at center of rod and perpendicular to it all the time then 
find the time dependence of external force F. Okay. Uh, assuming <coughs> rod is moving with constant angular velocity omega. So, question is clear. Yes. So, do this. <coughs> Try this. Can you just come back in a
Good answer. Then I came back yesterday. Okay, fine. Not a wish. You can start now. Sir, yes, I start.
got the answer? Okay, so here, <clears throat> if you draw the FBD, MG is acting downward, right? Yes, sir. So on the road, MG will act like this. And the force we are applying is acting perpendicular. So it can act along or against so it, it really depends you can choose either this or this because what the only information given is it is this way or this way so let's choose both ways <coughs> let's say like this and we know that <coughs> the torque of the magnetic field will be always opposing right yes. so the magnetic torque will be like this or you can say ampere torque. And therefore, because it's moving with constant the angle of velocity, so we can say that the net torque must be zero. Yeah. Since omega is constant, that implies net torque must be zero. 
And now, if since net torque is zero, what we can write? So, <clears throat> torque of F will be F into L by two. I'm taking that as positive. So, torque of the the ampere torque will be also in the same sense, <coughs> but the gravity will be opposite, right? Mg into L by two sine omega t, isn't it? Yes. So, F L by two will be. mg l by 2 <coughs> sin omega t minus and uh, ampere torque was how much if you remember so it was uh, <coughs> i into yeah tell me sir so b square by 4 omega square by 4 right yeah so just looking at that that value so it was b square l power 4 Me, L cube. L cube. Okay, I'll just check it. So I haven't written any there. The full answer. Anyway, we can derive it. So B square L cube omega square by four that I was thinking. Just me. I L. Okay, so you were saying the F value, right? Yes. Sir. Okay. So it is B square L cube omega by two, right? This is what you said. Correct. Hello, hello. Yes. Sir. Or if you you would have taken uh, <coughs> f in the opposite sense, then uh, f and the torque of gravity would have balanced the the ampere torque. So, or if we reverse f, the f will be how much? Then the answer would have been this, right? Yes. All right. So, yeah, this is the answer. You can keep this as the answer. All right. So it would have been. Plus, right? Uh, this one. Oh no, it will be minus uh, one. Wait, this one, right? Yes. Now, similar to the. <coughs> the force based problem like in which we have a resistor and we had a resistor and uh, we applied a constant force f on the rod 
uh, we can replicate the same idea here also for uh, uh, a rotating circuit as well. So in a way, every question that we have solved for the translation can be solved for the rotation as well. All right, so this is, uh, you can again replicate the questions of capacitor with uh, the torque, this question, like when the rod is given a torque or something like that. Okay. So we can always create a question like that. The next is called, So, so far the question that we solved, we had a either moving conductor or we were changing the, the area of the loop and hence we were changing the flux. So, so far the way the flux was changed was due to the change of area. <coughs> okay. So, as I said that uh, to create the induced EMF, we need to change the flux, but flux can itself be changed in a variety of ways. So we have seen that how to create a flux using variation of A, and now we're going to vary the B itself to get the induced EMF. Okay. So now we have time varying magnetic field. Okay. So to begin with, we'll start with a, a very famous solenoid. So this is the cross-sectional view of the sunlight. So generally what happens? The current carrying wire will wrap up a large number of turns of the wire. Let's do it here also.
So imagine the current is I. So we know that the B for infinite solenoid is given by form of mu not n i. Okay. And because B is mu not n i. So what if the current starts varying over time? So what if the I is varying with time? Let's say diability is non-zero. So let's call it positive value as of now. We could take negative. The idea is it should be varying with time, and that is what we are doing. But the moment you make this uh, diability variable, <coughs> because the B depends on I, so the B will also start varying as I will change. Correct. So the loop of the solenoid itself. Will experience a time varying flux because if you remember the flux through the loop is, or you can say flux through the solenoid is a B into A <laughs> into number of turns, where capital N is the total number of turns. So the solenoid flux of the solenoid uh, through the solenoid. Itself is n b a, and uh, the n is not changing, a is not changing, but b is a variable. So we can say that d phi by d t will be d b by d t like this. <laughs> and accordingly, accordance with the Faraday's law, so it will say that okay, whenever there is a change of flux, the EMF will be induced. The EMF induced here will be <laughs> we are writing just value. And uh, <clears throat> you can clearly see that d b by d t can be replaced by mu not n d i by d t. <laughs> so the e induced turns out to be mu not <coughs> n, which we can write as capital N by L into d i by d t. So this becomes mu not n square a by l into d over dt. Let's take a value. And later on, after this topic, we are going to learn this entire constant term we represent by the symbol l. And this l we call the self inductance of solenoid. <coughs> You want to say something? Pardon? So yes. you asked if I was saying something, right? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So were you saying something? No. Sir. Okay. So this <clears throat> constant term which you're looking at here uh, right now, mu not a square a by l. This entire term is called the self inductance of solenoid. So that is what we'll come to know which is the next topic. <coughs> but the whole idea is whenever there is a change of flux, EMF will be induced. And now you can see here, we are affecting the, <coughs> the EMF of the, uh, we are creating the EMF of this solenoid using the time variation. So sorry, a time variation of current. So as the current will vary with time, the B will change with time. As B will change with time, the Flux, which is interlinked, will also change with time, and that in turn will create the EMF induced. So solenoid will going to oppose this behavior. So any change in the <coughs> current, whether you want to increase it or you want to decrease it, it is the natural tendency for the solenoid to oppose it because we know that <coughs> EMF is uh, by product of opposition. So it will always oppose this change. And this term, which we call self inductance, is also known as the electrical inertia. It's a measurement of electrical inertia of a circuit. So every circuit will offer you some inertial character, some inertia, or some resistance to change. And that property, that property which helps the circuit to oppose the change, 
in the current value that property we call inductance okay so <clears throat> inductance is a property of circuit by virtue which it will tend to change the any change in any change in uh, yeah any change in flux through it you can say or change in current through it so in many cases it is the current but in general we call it will oppose the flux change through itself so in general it will oppose the flux okay. so in question where the flux is only changing by virtue of change of current we can also say that it will oppose the current change so the general answer is flux change but a specific answer is current change when flux dependency is only on the current itself okay and now <clears throat> if uh, we choose current to be this way So if you look from the left hand side, if we have an observer here, what he will see is a, a region of magnetic field, which is circular, right? And entire this region will have the transverse field, okay, which field? dot across <laughs> the field which uh, will see will be dot dot excellent correct it is dot because the field is towards you right yes Okay, anyway. Similarly, if you look from this side, the, the other end, So you can also think of that the solenoid is a way to create cylindrical magnetic field. So you have a confinement of field, which is cylindrical. And what you're looking at is the cross-sectional view. So these two are the cross-sectional view of the field. <laughs> and uh, because we are changing the currents in a way, we are changing the 
b itself so here dv by dt is non zero i could take positive and i could take negative okay. so now <clears throat> If I draw a cylindrical region of magnetic field, <coughs> let me draw a big contour. And if it is completely occupied with transverse field, similar to what I represented in the case of solenoid. So this is a cylindrical region filled with uh, uniform magnetic field. Now, what is the meaning of uniform? The value is same. You can say it is spread throughout in a similar fashion, but it is not steady. So this is called uniform. but non steady fluid So, <coughs> so now to understand that, okay, now what you can see here, the field itself is changing. So any loop which you draw and if, so if you draw a random loop here, the flux at one instant is uh, having some value, but very next instant will have different value because the B itself is changing. And what you can realize that for flux to change, the loop is now do not need to be moving or rotating or turning at all. So this is purely stationary loop. Okay. <coughs> so now what we can see that in a purely stationary loop, we can have induced EMF if B starts changing itself. Now, the, what is the benefit is in a purely static loop, we cannot have motional EMF. So this EMF is certainly a different kind of EMF compared to all the previous cases that we have solved so far. So earlier, what I said that, okay, whether you use the Faraday law to deduce the answer or whether you use the, the motional EMF, both will give you the same answer, but now I'm, I'm not going to say the same. Now the entire mechanism of induction has changed because we have a static loop. So in case of static loop, what we need to remember is that the EMF cannot be emotional. It could be anything but emotional, I mean, emotional. So now we are going to face a totally different kind of induction process. That's why this topic is kept as a separate topic because the entire process is going to differ from all the previous cases that we discussed. <laughs> 
so what we're going to learn in this topic is that what happens if we have a uniform but non steady field and then we have a static loop so we can understand what is happening there so to <clears throat> understand the process we have to assume something so let's say make an assumption that there is a loop so what i'm doing, doing is i'm going to draw a concentric circle or you can say concentric loop and this loop is made of some connecting wire so this is some All right. Now, <clears throat> the moment to keep the loop here, for sure, we don't have any motion kind of thing. Okay. So, first of all, we cannot think of what we cannot think of motion image. So, here we are going to <coughs> talk about. static loop therefore idea of motional <coughs> emf is out of question <coughs> So the whole idea of motional EMF is out of question because uh, we have a static loop. But if you invoke the Faraday law, flux is changing, EMF will be induced, and hence current will also be induced because uh, we have a closed circuit, so current will be induced. And if current will be induced, so the, we can say charge will be in motion. But a magnetic force cannot, you know, apply force on a charge at rest. So now this is the, like the biggest question here: that who moves the charge? Because we know that for a static charge, magnetic field can do nothing. So far, we had motional enough in which the charges were in motion because of the rod. <laughs> so even though <coughs> they were at rest in the beginning, the field was applying force because those charges were in motion because of the uh, the moving part of the circuit. So that moving charge experienced the force and that is how the motion enough came into picture. Now, in case of purely static field, we don't have such uh, moving parts. And therefore, even though the magnetic field is there, it cannot create any force. But Faraday law insists that there must be some current in the loop which in turn manifests that uh, there must be some force on the charge. So who can move the static charge? <clears throat> Tell me. How to move the static charge? And the answer is? Static charge can be moved only with the help of electric. Electrostatic. I mean, Sorry. electric. Sorry. Yes. And that is a manifestation, that is a way to deduce the fact or manifest or re that reveals that <clears throat> a time varying magnetic field must be source of electric field. So a time varying magnetic field actually creates an electric field. And that electric field in turn applies force on the electron. And by, by virtue of that force, it, <coughs> it starts moving. But the question is how the field should be to continue the motion. So if I assume the field to be in a one particular direction, let's say if I say, field is this way, 
then this electron can move a bit this electron can move due to the component of field but this electron cannot move because the field is like this and so this field cannot have component along the tangent right so if i choose a unique direction of field what will happen if i choose a unique current. direction of field then the current it cannot be established yes sir. current current the current cannot be established so it means this idea of assumption is also not going to work so <coughs> a unique direction of field is also not correct here so that is definitely wrong so to continue the motion the field must vary its direction and if you think logically then we can understand that the field should be tangential yes so like a loops but it can't be a loop. correct <coughs> so at every point it will keep on turning and because it is keep on turning so it will make sure that the electrons in the wire is getting a constant force <coughs> to move now the question is the how the current and how sorry how the field should be so the direction of field must be as per the direction of current induced right so if you if you apply the faraday's law you can see that i think i have taken the opposite <coughs> So what you can see, if dv by dt is positive, the flux through the inner loop, the flux through the inner loop is the flux through the inner loop is increasing with time. Sir, yes, sir. Increase. Increase. So, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Now I can hear. You. Increasing with time. <coughs> Why? Because the dy by dt is positive. And uh, in the inward direction. So, direction of flux is inward. Yes. So we can say that inward flux is growing. <coughs> we can say that. In the word fluxes growing with time. So as per Lenz law, <clears throat> the induced current will try to compensate. And to compensate, the induced current must be anti-clockwise. Yes. So now we are getting one idea from Faraday's law that okay, it should be like this. And because <clears throat> the current has to move anti-clockwise, so the field must support the motion. And therefore, we can say the electric field at every point on the loop must be tangential. Now you can see that I have taken the same value. Why? Because every point on the periphery is equidistant from the center, right? Yes. Which means these all are symmetrical point so we cannot distinguish between the two points we cannot say that this point is uh, different from this point because of the cylindrical space or cylindrical region of the magnetic field so for this circular or you can say cylindrical magnetic field every circle which you draw as a concentric circle will be symmetrical points or you can say equivalent points and because all points are equivalent so there is no <coughs> There is no like uh, uh, reason to say that the field must change. So by the idea of symmetricity, we can claim that the value of electric field should be equal in value at each of the points on the circle. And to continue the current flow, it must be tangential at all the points. Now the question is, the field is in this fashion okay <clears throat> and if i draw multiple circle and if i draw multiple field it will look like a vortex right 
isn't it like a tornado wheel right yes so <clears throat> these field lines which we have shown here will form a large number of concentric circles one after the other and these circles <clears throat> are actually representing the the field in the space which is actually present and it is being developed due to the time variation of magnetic field and it has nothing to do with the conductor so whether we do have conductor or not the field is there it is the conductor which is, after getting immersed get those field okay so once you immerse it the electron will get that field and that field will start moving the electron and hence will establish the current <coughs> it is clear Okay, so I hope this is there. So the plugs through the loop. Okay, this is fine. So what is the takeaway here? That uh, the electric field is already there. The conductor which you bring it here in the region will experience the electric force, which in turn will create the current. And to create the current, it must be tangential to the path. <coughs> and uh, why we drew the circular path? Because by virtue of symmetricity every point on the concentric circle will have same value of electric field strength okay so now the question is how to get this e value i want to know this e at a distance r from the center so how to get e as a function of r So the answer is very simple. <coughs> Think of Faraday's law. Yes. E induces d phi by dt. Yes. Sir. Which is minus, <coughs> and uh, d phi by dt will be. So we have a flux which is inward. So we can write as d by dt of minus because we take inward flux as negative. So what is that? <coughs> B into pi r square, right? Yes. And pi r square is constant here. Yes. So E induces pi r square d by dt. Okay. But still, <clears throat> this is the induced image, but we were looking for E value, how to get E value. So we have to think of the <clears throat> electrostatics. That if you know the field in a space, we can find the potential difference between the two points. So for the closed path, the E induced for a closed path, you can address integration of E dot DL. Not for conservative field, which we know that uh, E and DL in a closed path will give you zero answer, right? <coughs> but here the field is changing as you move. In fact, the DL and E will always be parallel, isn't it? Yes. And therefore, this turns out to be, and you can see we are using plus sign here. <coughs> so this turns out to be E DL cos zero. And because E is constant for the entire loop, you can take it out. 
and DL, if you add all DL, we get the perimeter, which is. So the perimeter of the loop is how much? 2 pi r? Okay. Yes. So we can call this as equation number 2. So from 1 and 2, let me go to the next page. So from one and two, what you connect? T into two pi r equals to pi r square d by dt, and then pi gets cancelled, r gets cancelled. So E turns out to be as a function of R as R by 2. But this answer is only true if R is less than the dimension of the, the field. So the field is, is spread up to R. So the next part is <clears throat> what if so for R more than R, what to do? So LHS will be same, E into, so E dot DL we write for the loop, right? So imagine if I do a small, just to show you, if the magnetic field is confined up to this region, let's call this as R, and the loop is beyond this but it is kept concentric. So flux is still there. Okay. <clears throat> so the flux in this case will be how much? And because this is the loop we are drawing. So E dot DL we calculate for the loop part. So if I say, <coughs> if I say D by dt is positive if dv by dt is positive then the flux through the loop the bigger loop okay will be again positive so it will create a current induce and current induce will try to compensate the the increase in flux so it will be nt clockwise right like this so now the E dot DL, <coughs> we have to write it for the outer loop, right? So <coughs> so <coughs> this will become flux we can add as pi capital R square because beyond r we don't have any field so we don't have flux so flux is only up to r and d by dt and then the e becomes outside because e dot dl is e into 2 pi r r is now beyond r so the e beyond the region confinement will be So there are two formula, one for the inside. So if you plot E versus R,
So if you plot the graph between E versus R, then first of all, it will grow with R as a linear function of R up to the region of the field. But beyond that, it will start decaying inversely proportional to R. So <clears throat> the boundary will be the part at which it is maximum. So you can see that in case of uh, solenoid, if you change the V by varying the current, the maximum electric field you will get is on the surface of the solenoid. Or you can see the strongest field will be at the surface. So at the axis, the field is zero. As you go away from the axis, the field will grow. And you can imagine a three-dimensional circular field of concentric field, concentric electric field around the solenoid. The moment you start varying the current, okay. So we have to do a lot of problem based on these two idea, which we just derive the two formula, the E inside and the E outside. So we call E inside and E outside. Okay. So we'll continue the discussion, I mean, same discussion, and we'll solve some of the very nice challenging problems from this topic. And thereafter, we'll move to the last topic of this chapter called the mutual induction and self induction. And then we have a topic called the LC oscillation and LR circuit. So <coughs> all those things will, I think, take a maximum two lectures. And then we'll be done with the EMI. And then we can start the AC, which will take hardly two lectures. And that will almost end your class 12 syllabus from electrodynamics. The rest will be modern physics, which will start. OK. Uh, and yeah, we'll start the modern physics and optics together. So we'll finish modern physics, optics, wave optics, and then we'll come back to the remaining part of the 11, which is like uh, ray optics, uh, heat and thermodynamics, SHM, uh, fluid, and all. Okay. All right, bye and take care. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, and also yeah. like yesterday's PPT and today's PPT both can you forward? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. All right.